Philippians chapter 3, if you go ahead. Philippians chapter 3. This evening, I'm going to begin reading in verse 4 and read down to verse 11. Have you ever come across a verse in the Bible where you read it a dozen times and you said, wonder what that means? And you just kept moving on. And you do that every time you read it. Um, that's the verse that I'm going to highlight as a title tonight. Uh, the verse that I have said for a long time, not sure what that means, but now preaching through Philippians, I said I better find out what that means. Because if I'm going to preach it, I better know. So Philippians 3, would you stand if you're able to stand with me, beginning in verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Let me stop there and just say this. We understand it's the Apostle Paul speaking. He's speaking to the church at Philippi. And he's talking about himself. Verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. We'll stop there. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. Lord, I'm thankful that tonight, as a child of yours, for those of us that know you, we're counted as your sheep. Lord, we need you tonight. Please lead us, direct us, help us. Father, I pray you'd fill me with thy spirit as I preach your word, as I do, Lord, what you've called me to do. Enable me to preach. Guide and direct my thoughts and words. And again, fill me with thy spirit. And I pray, Lord, that all of us tonight would have the same desire that the Apostle Paul had here. And understanding what he's saying here in this text. Please illuminate our minds to the scriptures tonight by thy spirit. Help us, Lord, we pray. But not only just to understand the scriptures, but to put them into practice. So we need you tonight. Please bless and again remove any distractions from this room and from our minds this evening. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm sure as I was reading through those verses, you probably were wondering which is the verse he's talking about. And perhaps it was pretty evident, but for me, uh, the verse that I'd like to consider what the Apostle Paul was saying here to these Philippians, uh, although I'll deal with the entire passage, I believe it comes to a pinnacle, if you will, a crescendo, if you will, in verse 11. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here. If by any means I might attain under the resurrection of the dead. What does that mean? What does it mean? What is he saying? If by any means I might attain under the resurrection of the dead. Well, can we take it apart for a moment as means of introduction? We see a word, the word attain. That's an easy definition, if by any means I might attain. To attain means to achieve. It means to reach by means of effort. So he's trying to achieve something. He's trying to exert effort to obtain or attain something. What is it that he's trying to attain? Well, he says it. He says under the resurrection of the dead. Does that make you wonder? Does me. Achieving the resurrection of the dead? Do you know there are four different resurrections spoken of in the Bible? Did you know that? 
There is not one general resurrection. There was a resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's recorded in the gospel records. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us about it. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, paid our sin debt in full, but it did not end there. He rose from the dead. Praise God for that. He did not stay in that grave. That's one resurrection. Then there's another resurrection in the Bible. It is the resurrection of New Testament believers. If you're here tonight and you're saved, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, that's you. That's me. We'll look at it in a moment, but we find it recorded one of the places, other than the place we're going to in a moment, is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23. But there's more. There's more. There's a resurrection of Old Testament saints. We find that in the book of Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. It is my conviction that the New Testament believers and the Old Testament saints are resurrected at different times. I believe we find that at the second coming of Jesus Christ, at his revelation. There is a resurrection there, according to Daniel chapter 12. Who will be resurrected? Old Testament saints. But there's another one. There is a resurrection of the unsaved dead. It's found in Revelation chapter 20, and verse 11. Those that are lost will be resurrected. When they die now, they get cast into hell to be resurrected, uh, to stand at the great white throne judgment, only to be cast in the lake of fire forever. That's the fourth resurrection. Which one is he speaking of here? Well, obviously, I believe he's speaking of the resurrection of New Testament believers. It is also known as the rapture. You looking forward to that? The rapture is the next event on God's calendar, if you will. It is an event just prior to the tribulation where the bodies of the church-age saints, both living and dead, will in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, be risen from the dead, raised from the dead. We will be changed. A corruption shall put on incorruption. We will be reunited with our spirits, and we will have glorified bodies for all eternity. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. So what does it mean then? We're back to square one. We understand attain. We understand he's talking about the resurrection of New Testament believers. What does he mean when he says that I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead? Well, I believe we can first say what he does not mean. And we know what he does not mean because of what other scriptures tell us. He is not saying here that he's trying to earn being resurrected. That's not what he's saying here at all. The Bible is very clear that the resurrection is not attained by any works on our part. I'll prove that to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here we read of the rapture of the believers. And we read in verse 13, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Notice, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice the two words in verse 16, in Christ, in Christ. You see, the rapture is promised for all of those who are in Christ. All of those who have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. This is a promise for every believer. Amen. So he's not talking about working to somehow earn this resurrection. So what is he talking about? You're anxious to find out, aren't you? Me too, because I have no idea. No, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> what I believe he's talking about is an event that's tied with the resurrection. It is an event that occurs immediately after the resurrection. Do you know what that is? 
It's the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. You see, the Bible often ties together the, the resurrection and reward. Revelation 22, 12, Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work, uh, according as his work shall be. Paul is talking about here, understand, uh, attaining rewards uh, at the judgment seat of Christ when he's resurrected. Let me see if I can't explain a little better. I like the way Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35 puts it. Listen very closely. We read in this great faith chapter that women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Notice that they might obtain a better resurrection. A better one. You see, I believe it was Paul's desire to be obedient to his Lord. To, to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, to please Him, and to give His all. And He knows that it is a judgment seat of Christ that is tied in with this resurrection that is going to reveal whether or not He was. And so what does He want to do? He wants to attain a better resurrection. And I don't want to preach on the subject. Attaining a better resurrection. You know that all of us have a meeting with God? Oh, we meet with Him every day. I understand that. He is in our presence. But we all have a face-to-face -face meeting with God. And I'm talking about the believer tonight. You may say, well, I'm saved here, preacher. I I I'm okay. You may be okay for salvation. But what about the judgment seat? How are you going to fare? How am I going to fare? Uh, there's no escaping this meeting with God. And I don't know about you, but I want that meeting to go well. Do you want it to go well? I do. We read in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, And now, little children, abide in me, that when, we sh when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to have to hang my head when the rapture occurs and I know I have a meeting with God. I know it's there. I want it to go well. If that's true, then why don't we take care of now so we have a better meeting then? But that goes against our human nature, doesn't it? I, I can think of so many award ceremonies I've been in. I played sports growing up. I played baseball. I, played, I, I, I wrestled, you know that. I played football and all that. And I, I've attended many award ceremonies. And I've sat there wondering if I was going to get something. But you know, there were times that I knew I wasn't going to get something. I knew it. I knew I did not give my all. When they were talking about the best player of the year, the, uh, the most consistent player, and here I was thinking, uh, I know I'm not going to get that, but I hope I do, but I don't think I am. There's so many other people that did better than me, and certainly what happened was I didn't get it. But at that day, I thought, why? Why didn't I do better before? It's going to be the same way at the judgment seat. We're going to sing that song in our minds, I wish I had given him more. If we're going to sing that then, then why don't we take care of it now so that we have, we can attain that better resurrection. Let's go back to our text here in Philippians chapter 3. And I believe we find several decisions that Paul made. I believe that's, the, like I said, the capstone of what he's saying here in this passage. The capstone of what he just said about attaining this resurrection. And I believe he made several decisions that would guarantee him a better resurrection. You say, what are they? Let me show you them. Number one, notice Paul's conclusion. His conclusion. Notice how he starts. Paul came to a conclusion about life. Can I ask you something, young person? Have you come to a conclusion about life? What is your life about? What it is about? He came to this conclusion. Notice what he says here in verse 4. He says, So I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh. Notice he says, I'm more. He's taking some time to reflect on his life in the flesh. In other words, his life before he got saved. He's looking back at and describing what his old pursuits were, the direction he was going, and the conclusion that he had come to. 
You know, if there was a man who would have been voted man of the year before he was saved, it would have been the Apostle Paul. If there was a man who would have been voted the up-and-coming star in Judaism, it would have been the Apostle Paul. If you were to ask anybody who is the most likely to succeed, all fingers would have pointed to the Apostle Paul. It would have been this Saul of Tarsus. You see, in the world's eyes, this man was educated. He was everything anybody that was Jewish wanted to be. He was educated. He had notoriety. He was living the life of a Jew. He had fame. He had respect. Notice the description of himself in verse 5. He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Notice the word stock. He was born in a home that was very religious. He was a purebred, pure, full-blooded Jew. And he was proud of it. There was no Gentile blood flowing in his veins. He, he, his parents were meticulous in observing the Old Testament law. Can you see them raising up this little boy? To be the Jew that he, they thought he should be. He was brought up in the finest Jewish theological institutions. Of the finest Jewish education possible at the feet of Gamaliel. Notice he says he was of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin. If you were to rank tribes, you would perhaps rank tribe number one, Judah. But you know who the second tribe would be? Benjamin. These were the two that did not defect, if you will, when the kingdom split. They were the tribe, Benjamin, that gave Israel their first king, King Saul. They were the tribe that refused to depart with Jeroboam when he took the ten tribes to the north again, but joined Judah in the south. The men of Benjamin were known in Judaism to all the other tribes as mighty men of valor. And that's what he was. He was a Benjamite and proud of it. Notice what else he says. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's an interesting phrase. What does that mean? Well, you know, many of the Jews during the time of the Romans and the Grecians gave up their heritage. They did. They adopted the Greek language. They were called Hellenists. They adopted the Greek culture. They adopted Greek customs. Uh, they abandoned the Old Testament dietary laws. They abandoned the Old Testament laws. Yet there was a still a very, very small segment of Jews that st stayed true uh, to the religion of Judaism. And Paul was one of them. Can you see him shooting out his chest as he's walking around in Jerusalem? He says next, notice if you will, that he was a Pharisee. That was the strictest sect of Judaism. It was not like the Herodians that adopted the Roman culture. It was not like the Sadducees who were of the Jews, but they denied the resurrection. They denied the existence of angels. They denied life after death. Paul was an all-in Pharisee pursuing the life of a Jew. But then we get to verse 7. And we read this word, but something happened. You say, what happened? He got saved. Something happened on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He met the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but understand something. He not only got saved, uh, he came to realize something that was vitally important. You say, what was it? That everything he did in the world it was absolutely a waste of time. A waste of time. An absolute waste of time. Notice he says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He, he looked back and he said, You know, everybody thought I was great. And I walked around like I was something. But I'll tell you what, it was an absolute waste of time. Notice what he says in the next verse, in verse 8. He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Notice, and do count them but dung. So as I look back at what the world offered, I look back at, at what consumed me then. I look back at what uh, the world convinced me to do, uh, and I see that, and I count it as nothing but dung. That's all it was. That's a pretty strong word if you ask me. 
But that's how he felt. Can I ask us all something tonight? What are you pursuing? Stop and think for a moment. What are you pursuing? What is your life's pursuit? What are you seeking? What is it? Do you know what you and I pursue will determine how we fare at the resurrection? Did you ever think of it that way? How are you going to fare? You know that just because you're a believer and just because you're in church tonight does not mean you're pursuing the right things. Now, I'm glad you're here. And you should be here. But just being here does not automatically make it that you're pursuing the right thing. You know, some believers follow sinful pleasures. It's true. You know them and I know them. They may be glad that they're saved. If you buttonhole them somewhere, some uh, out in the community somewhere on their job, you start talking to them about the Lord, uh, they'll gladly and quickly say to you that, yes, I know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. They may even point back to a time in their life where they trusted Christ as Savior, but they have absolutely no desire, no interest in living the Christian life. None. They'd much rather pursue what the world has to offer. They'd much rather pursue sinful pleasures. They'd rather live like the world. They'd rather talk like the world. They'd rather look like the world. They'd rather do the things that the world does. They're following sinful pleasures. Perhaps more Christians have been caught up with this one. Some believers follow shallow pursuits. Preacher, that's not me. I'm not out there carousing the town. I'm not out there drinking and doing drugs and using foul language and telling dirt, dirty jokes. No, that's not me. Maybe not. Maybe not. What are you pursuing? What am I pursuing? Sometimes we pursue things that are a waste of time. You ever think of it that way? That are a waste of life. Some believers pursue shallow things like materialism. They'll pursue shallow things like fame. And they'll seek to be some sort of sports star or some sort of talent person. Or they'll seek popularity or power or to big build some sort of worldly empire. Oh, they're not carousing the town. But their emphasis is on shallow pursuits. Is that you? It reminds me of Je what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 13, 22. He also that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh unfruitful. You see, we have to get to the place where we look at what the world has to offer. And, and, and it almost, if you will, almost, I'm speaking metaphorically, makes us sick. I don't want any of that. I don't want one bit of that. I want nothing to do. I, that's what I was wrapped up in before, but I don't want that anymore. And that's where the Apostle Paul came to. He came to this conclusion that everything he was doing before was absolutely nothing. Which leads us to point number two. Notice his realization what has he realized? Notice he says in Philippians chapter 3, let's pick it up in verse 7 again. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Notice the phrase, for Christ. For Christ! For my Savior! For the King of kings and Lord of lords! Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He realized something. He came to the crossroads in his life, and he made a decision. Do you know every child of God, every saved person, comes to the same crossroads, perhaps once, perhaps many times, and that is this. What am I going to live for? What am I going to 
going to live for? May I remind us all that there's only one shot at life? May I remind us all that there's, it's not like a video game where you can restart or, or start over, whatever you want to say, and do it, do it again, you know. Uh, take over. Remember that as a kid? I'm going to take over now. I'm going to start again. There is none of that in life. And the Bible describes our life as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. It is as a tale that is told before you know it. It is gone. What are you going to to live for. Paul realized there's only one purpose to live, and that purpose is a person. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing else worth living for than Him. That's why I said in Philippians 1.21, if you look over there, please, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know one mistake we make so often is this. We get the idea that those types of decisions of our purpose in life, that's for those, you know, that's for those people going in the ministry. That's for those people, you know, that are giving their life to full-time Christian service. Certainly it includes those, but it's not exclusive to those. It is a decision that every believer has to make. What is our life about? What's it about? What's it about? You know, surrender is not to a place. Surrender is, is not to a position. Surrender is to a person. It is that person, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what surrender is. It's saying, Lord, I surrender to you whatever you want me to do. It's not a place. It's not about that. It's not about some position or title that I hold. I will do whatever you want me to do. Is that what you want? You know what's interesting about it is when he writes this phrase, understand, when he said that he counted that life as dung and that he was seeking the Lord, do you know he wrote this after he'd been through three missionary journeys already? He had already experienced persecutions. He had already experienced beatings. He already experienced all the things uh, that are listed there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where he was, uh, we read, in, uh, beaten with rods. Uh, once he was stoned, uh, thrice suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen. On and on he goes. After that, he says, it's all worth it. Everything I went through worth it. Oh, I'm glad I made that decision. You see, he realized that there is nothing, nothing, nothing in this world that can bring the peace, the contentment, the joy, the satisfaction as surrendering to God can bring. Nothing. Have you got to that place yet? Have you? So many young people, they like to straddle the fence. They like to be one day in church and a Christian and living and acting like a, 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 they ought to act and then a, another day chasing the things of the world. Uh, can I say you this? You're in for trouble. You're in for absolute trouble. Why don't you believe the Bible? Believe what God says. There is no satisfaction outside of Jesus Christ. None. And we will not fare well at the judgment seat of Christ if we never get to that place. I've known believers that have spent their entire life waffling back and forth between the world and the Christian life, the world and the Christian life, and never fully surrendering to God. What a waste of life that is. Can you imagine that day when the resurrection occurs and they have to stand before our Lord, their Lord, and give an answer? For why they didn't surrender to him? Sad, isn't it? It's sad. There's a third thing I want you to notice tonight. Not only Paul's conclusion, not only his realization, but notice Paul's ambition. Watch what he does here. Stay with me, and I hope I explain this right. Notice what he says in verse 10. He says... 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Notice what he said. His conclusion was this world has nothing to offer. There's nothing out there that I need. His realization that the only purpose to live is the Lord Jesus Christ. But now he's saying, here's what I desire. Here's what I want. He says, I want to know him. I want to know him. Do you want to know him? Think about that for a moment. Do you want to know him? You say, I know him. I'm saved. I'm not talking about that. I don't think he's talking about that. His knowing him as Savior was referred to uh, back in, uh, in verse 8 where he says, for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ uh, my Lord. He's not talking about just knowing him as Savior. I hope tonight everybody in this room knows him as Savior. If not, get saved tonight. Amen. You may say, I know Christ as my Savior. Wonderful. There's something further than that in the Christian life. It is a pursuit. It is a seeking. You may say this, I know about him. You know, I think a lot of Christians make that mistake. They say, I know about him. You may know about him. You may be able to say, this is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh, 100% man, 100% God. At the same time, you may even be able to remember the word, the hypostatic union. You may be able to quote verses about the Lord Jesus Christ and off in your mind and, and over and over, repeat them out. Do you know that that doesn't mean you know him? Coming to church doesn't mean you know him. Reading your Bible doesn't mean you know him. So many Christians live the mechanical Christian life. I'll do my devotion, blah, 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 blah. There, I'm done. I did it. You'll never know him that way. You'll never know him. What's he talking about here? Paul knew something. He wanted to know him. How do we know him? Do you know that if you want to know the Lord as Paul desired to know the Lord and have a better resurrection, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost. Notice he says that he wanted to seek three things to know him better. Notice that I may know him. Notice the first one, the power of his resurrection. Paul was not satisfied with just a mediocre Christian life. He was not satisfied with just uh, doing or certain things mechanically. He wanted to see the power of God in his life. You long for that? Sometimes I feel like we live in an age where it's hard to move any of us. It's hard to move any of our hearts anymore. We become so accustomed to what we do. We become so settled in the place that we are. And here we see Paul saying he wants uh, uh, this better resurrection. And he has an ambition. He knows what it takes to get it. He wants to, he wants to experience the power of his resurrection. Have you ever seen God's power in your life? Have you ever experienced God's power? Have you ever allowed Jesus Christ to live through you and work through you and live in you in a way that you have experienced the power of God? The power to get victory over sin? The power to give you the ability to serve? The power to see Him do things exceeding above all that we ask or think through us? To many Christians, that's foreign. It's foreign. Do you know the same power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that's available to me and you to live the Christian life? But do you want it? Do you want it? And he said a second thing that's going to cost him, this knowing God, the fellowship of his sufferings. You know a good way to experience the fellowship of his sufferings? Witness. 
Speak up. Take a stand. Speak out to a lost and dying world. Oh, so many of us have fallen into the rut if we just let this lost and dying world pass us by and we do not enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. You ever been laughed at for your belief? You ever been mocked about what you believe? Have people ever said things to you, ridiculing you for your stand? Have you ever truly bore a reproach for the name of Jesus Christ? never know him better if you do. And then notice the third thing. He said being made conformable to his death. What does that mean? Again, here's the cost. He wants to know God in an intimate way. He wants to see Christ experience him in his life. He wants to know the power of his resurrection. He wants to experience the fellowship of his sufferings. And he wants to be made conformable to his death. Nothing likes to die. Nothing. Everything that lives fights for life. And that includes the flesh. Christ's death was a self-imposed death. No man took his life from him, amen? He willingly gave himself for me and for you. And Paul knew that to be like Christ and to know him, he had to die as well. He had to die. You see, a better resurrection is only going to come for me. This person, Terry Moore, dies. And he dies. When I die to myself, when I die to my own ambitions, to my own, uh, uh, my own pride, I must die. And by the way, this dying isn't a one and done deal. It is a daily dying and dying and dying and dying and dying. You see, my friend, that's how you'll attain better resurrection. You see, when we know him, he lives through us. So tonight I want to ask you, does it matter how you fare? Do you care how you fare at the judgment seat of Christ? If so, if you're thinking ahead, and we ought to, by the way, we ought to, according to Psalm 90, uh, number our days and apply our hearts unto wisdom. Well, we must do that. Then we must come to the conclusion that this world has nothing to offer. We must come to the realization that Jesus Christ is worth living for. And we must desire to know him in a way that's going to cost us something. Cost us something. But I'll tell you what, when that day comes, We'll be glad. And we will know God in this life as we never knew him before. A better resurrection. It's possible. What an example in the life of the Apostle Paul. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today and ask you to bless what we heard. Oh, Lord.